forgiven because you were forsaken and I'm accepted you were condemned and I'm alive and well your spirit father we're th so thankful me. to you that because we once again can you just listen to your voice through your word and father I just ask you that you would speak and that we your servants would listen in Jesus name we're gonna um, talk about the cross this afternoon because um, the cross Jesus is the center of everything in our Christian life and the cross and resurrection life have to always be the focus New Agers are coming in to Christianity in an awesome, with an awesome invasion. And they will say, they will talk about and teach very well about everything except the cross. Jesus will not be central. They will even teach about Jesus, but the cross and resurrection life and the necessity of our dying to the flesh will never be touched on by the New Agers. And, and the New Agers will be so in agreement with the Harlot Church system that much of what causes megachurches to grow is all the emphasis on self. Somebody told me that last week in Lubbock, they, they went to a, a concert and there was Starbucks in the lobby, and you know, the mega churches minister to every part of the flesh, every part um, gymnasiums, restaurants, um, Starbucks, and they're growing by leaps and bounds. Yet, crime is increasing at an unprecedented rate. Uh, it, every part of sin is flourishing. And yet, right alongside with it, the mega church is growing. But the big churches that are growing, all of the emphasis on me, 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 me. You'll never hear that we're called to die. You'll never hear about the cross of Christ. Their reaction response will be exactly like Peter's was when Jesus said, well, we'll read that in a minute, but when Jesus said he was on his way to die, Peter said, oh, pity yourself. Have pity on yourself. Don't talk like that. That is not a positive confession. You need to learn how to talk, Lord. Um, but expect the big, big churches to get bigger, bigger, bigger. But expect fewer to be finding the way to life. And, and that's sad, but it's just, it's the truth. And so we're going to look at some scriptures on the cross. Um, starting in, in Matthew 10, um, verse 1, And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness all manner of disease. Verse 8, heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you have received, freely give. Verse 16, behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be therefore wise as serpents and harmless, but that means unmixed as doves. Why would he say that about doves? Many of you know a dove has only one mate for life and it's said that in the scripture I think a, that a dove is single-eyed and so he says be as unmixed as doves. Whatever we mix in with the gospel renders the gospel of no effects. But beware of men for they will deliver you up to the councils and they will scourge you in their synagogues and you shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake. I want to talk about a minute, that being scourged in synagogues. I was saying at lunch that 
There's so many rabbit trails that I could go off on having to do with experiences. But um, when, when milk was being used mightily, uh, uh, John Bassano was pastor of First Baptist Church in Houston, and a lot of his deacons got set free. And uh, he wrote a book that was really against milk called Strange Doctrine. I have found it so funny that a woman, Beth Moore, I mean, eventually John, I guess, was voted out as pastor. A woman, Beth Moore, began teaching people by the thousands in that big auditorium where John Bassanio had preached against Mill, and much of what she teaches are the same truths that John Bassanio was calling strange doctrine. And Evelyn was just telling me that a young man without any credentials who was over um, at A&M preaching uh, just to young people, to students, is now the pastor of that church. 34-year-old with no credentials. You know what? God, man says, man does, but God has the final say. Isn't that wonderful? So we just need to not get our eyes on what's going on and not take offense when they scourge you in their synagogues. We just need to keep on keeping on and expect persecution and know if we're not getting persecution, we're, it's probably because we're not obeying him boldly. And you shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what you shall speak. For it shall be given you in that same hour what you shall speak. For it is not you that speak, but the spirit of your father which speaks in you. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child. And the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And you shall be hated of all for my name's sake. But he that endures to the end shall be saved. Now, uh, Jesus said that three times in his teaching. Do you think that was an error? Why do most, why do many people hate to hear that? Because we like a doctrine that says since we got our ticket punched, if we decide to be Lord of our own life, that we're still going to go to heaven. The flesh likes that fire insurance policy. But Jesus said three times, that is the one who endures to the end who will be saved. That endurance means you just stay under his teaching. You stay under his lordship. You don't... Um, apostatize um, by saying he's not the way and you don't just fall away um, which are different words um, you just keep being a dumb sheep following the shepherd sometimes we don't like the path he takes us on so what he's Lord amen but when they persecute you in this city, flee you into another. For verily I say unto you, you shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. If they've called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? You know, in many traditional churches, you are just fine until you start messing with demons. See, even that the religious people in Jesus' day, there had been healings before Jesus came. But when Jesus came, they said, nobody has ever, ever done this before. Nobody has ever had authority over demons before. And I'll tell you, the demons and people sure do rise up against you when you start talking in lots of circles about demons. And they will say that your master is Beelzebub. It's a dangerous thing to attribute the work of God to demons. Extremely, extremely dangerous.
Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, and hid that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness, speak ye in light, and what you hear in the ear, preach ye upon the housetops. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father? But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, you, you are of more value than many sparrows. Whatsoever, therefore, shall, whosoever, therefore, shall confess me, and that word is homo logio, which means say the same word before men, him will I say the same word about before my Father, which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny, and that deny means contradict me, contradict or disavow or reject. Whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. That's an interesting word, that second uh, uh, deny um, means it's two words. One is not, and the other one is pouring forth as water to speak, to say. So what God wants us, uh, I mean, he wants us to be being poured forth as water, what he's put in us. And any time that's stopped up, we're disowning, disavowing, contradicting him. And he's going to be doing the same thing before our Father. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son and daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And that lose it means destroy it. And he that loses, destroys his life for my sake shall find it. He that receives you receives me. And he that receives me receives him that sent me. He that receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. He that receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water only in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. You know, this morning when we were talking about the man at the pool of Bethesda, <clears throat> crippled, needing to get in the water. The Lord just spoke to me, look around you. They're all around you. They are sitting somewhere in an easy chair watching trash on television, lots of them. They're in nursing homes being ignored. Uh, uh, three Saturdays ago, Lynn and I went to um, Athens, Texas to try to find a an inmate's mother in the first nursing home we went to was just, um, it was just insanity, uh, right, in the, you know, it was just terrible. The second one was a little more sedate, but these older people just saying all sorts of things. But there was one just really refined little lady, and she was standing up against the wall next to the receptionist area. And she was just saying, I'm so afraid. I'm so afraid to die. Well, I'm so afraid. I'm afraid of everything. I'm so afraid to die. Can you save me? And I'm telling you, I mean, we were just going in and going out and in just a matter of seconds heard that. And later I said, Lynn, do you think we missed the Lord? Do you think that, that we should have stayed or we should have gone back? And I still don't know if we missed him or not. 
But I know the Lord was saying, they're all over like that. I'm so afraid. I'm so afraid of everything. I'm afraid to die. Can you save me? I thought, Lord, open our eyes. Open our ears. Don't let us become so busy with non-essentials that we keep walking right past them. And they've been there 38 years waiting for somebody to bring the water to them. And you know, most of those people in nursing homes have been abandoned. And it breaks your heart to go in and it's not in many respects, it's not pleasant ministry time. But if in a lifetime of going in, you could find one of those. And if you could convince her, because of Jesus, she doesn't have to be afraid anymore. I'm telling you, Jesus would prize that very highly. That's why it's so important that we redeem the time, our time because the days are evil, that we not let anything just become a time waster, that our <clears throat> cry to the Lord is, Lord, show me. Let your eyes look through my eyes so my eyes are looking at what you want to look at. Let me hear what you want me to hear. And then cause me to act as you everywhere that you want to go. The living water. They're all around us. Chapter 16. 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief preachers and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. You now Peter totally missed out on be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him saying, be it far from thee, Lord, is what King James says and the margin says, pity thyself. This this is not God's will for you. This shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offense unto me. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any will come after me, let him deny himself. That deny himself means disown himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save, and that means protect, whosoever will protect his life shall destroy it fully. But whosoever will destroy his life fully for my sake shall save it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul, destroy fully his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Mark 8. Verse 1. In those days, the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples and saith unto them, I have compassion on the multitude. If, if as you're reading the word, every time you see that Jesus had compassion, he moved. Compassion moved him. The scheme of the enemy in us is to get our hearts hardened through being hurt or through, through busyness our unbelief. So he shuts up our bowels of compassion so that we don't look at people the same way that Jesus sees them. We don't hear 
their cry when they're crying out uh, for help. So just began to see in the Word every place that Jesus had compassion. He did something as a response to his own compassion. And he's still doing that as we listen to him. And if when he, we're still enough to let him speak to us and give us compassion for someone, you can know that that's where he's going to do a miracle. If we'll just take the time to um, have compassion where he is. If I, if I send them away fasting to their own houses, they will faint, by the way, for divers of them come from far. And his disciples answered him, From whence can a man satisfy these with bread here in the wilderness? And he asked them, How many loaves have you? And they said, Seven. And he commanded the people to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves and gave thanks and break and gave to his disciples to set before them. And they did set them before the people. And they had a few small fishes, and he blessed and commanded to set them also before them. And they did eat and were filled. And they took up of the broken meat that was left seven baskets. And they that had eaten were about 4,000. And he sent them away. I don't think I want to keep reading with that. It's all good, but um, look in John 6 and we'll see what the, the lesson that, I mean, Jesus was always more about, about more than was visible. And he was showing us the spiritual truth there with the breaking of the bread. John 6, verse 35. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. 38, for I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he has given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which sees the Son and believes on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up on the last day. What if it is the will of the Father that someone see Jesus in you today, and that he would see Jesus in you in such pure love, that he is able to believe on Jesus, to believe that he is God in the flesh, and to believe that he loves that person. What if that is God's will for you today? And it is. But can't you see why there is such a war against us to not have a countenance that people can approach? God corrects me about that all the time. If I'm busy, if I'm tired, he'll say, a lot of times he'll say to me, think about how you look to others. I wouldn't want to approach me. <laughs> Verse 44, no man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. 47, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believes on me has everlasting life. And of course, all of you, I'm sure, know that that believe is not like I believe in George Washington. It's rely on, cling to, trust in. It's believe enough that I'm casting my whole being upon him. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. I was driving across country one time and listening to John listened to the Bible on tape. 
And I heard Jesus say that. And I said, what? As a little cumbersome in the King James, but he says, the bread which I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. And he was talking about going to Calvary and dying. But God shouted in my ear, the bread that you give for the life of those to whom I send you is your flesh. Laying down your life over and over and over. Jesus, the way he became the bread of life was by going to Calvary and then being resurrected and the way that we give others the bread of life is by laying down our life in this flesh for them as God directs us. It's not ever going to get any more complicated than that. The bread that I give for the life of the world, of my world, is my flesh. Now, you know what? We're going to be in positions where we have to give our flesh, lay down our life for people around us all the time. And we can do that with a grumbling and complaining heart and countenance. Or we can ask for the grace of life, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, to cause us to be willing to be bread. Because it's not just bread, it's broken bread. And it's not just bread, it's bread that started out as a grain of wheat. And the grain of wheat had to fall into the ground and die first. And as it fell into the ground and, and died down in that cold, hard, dark ground where that outward crust was being softened so it would fall away, surely felt like death. And that may be the place where God has some of you. That shell that has protected you, you thought has protected you from hurt, has not been a protection at all. It's just protected you from hearing the voice of God clearly and obeying. And so God has to put all of us in our season into that place of coldness and hardness and darkness to soften that husk. Or else we would never, ever die so that that life that is in us, the life of Christ, could come forth. And so that's the first step. We don't hear a lot preached about that. <clears throat> and then, seeming of itself, but the mystery of the seed, that life that was in the seed begins to push its way through that hardened soil. It's first the stalk and, and then the, the leaf and then the fruit. It just comes in its season. And then one day it's the season for harvest and you're cut down and taken into the threshing floor and threshed to separate the wheat again. And then the wheat is gathered up and it's ground and ground until it's powder. And then the uh, wheat is brought together and mixed with oil, picture of the Holy Spirit, formed into a loaf which is then put into a very hot oven. Then when it is time, a tool, which is really a pitchfork-like thing, pierces it through and brings it out. At that point, the bread is ready to be broken to feed the hungry. Are you in the process? 
are you resisting the process or are you cooperating with the process? And, and you know, at any of these points, we have a high priest who has suffered in all of these same things and, and has compassion on us. But his compassion will never deliver us from the things that will cause us to be broken bread. But his compassion will comfort us in those cold, hard, dark places. It will comfort us when we're being uh, winnowed, when we're being harvested, when we're being crushed. But love, God's love, will not deliver us any more than God's love could deliver Jesus because his was the same process. And so you have to... um, Make up your mind that you're going to hear the full call of God. That's why, that's why Jesus said, if, you, if you're going to come, you have to deny. You have to disown yourself. And you have to take up a cross, which is going to lead you to crucifixion. Crucifixion always comes at the hands of others. It is, it is one death that can never be self-imposed because you have to have another person to nail the nails in. And somehow, I guess we all wind up with that one that is uniquely qualified (laughs) to kill us. Now, I promise you that if you find a way to get down off of that cross, the next one may be like Peter's and be upside down. Because if we're going to be what he's called us to be, the water of life that goes to that man by the pool of Bethesda are the bread of life to feed these hungry. There's only one way to get there. And that's through death. And is it just once? No. No, as all of you know, it goes on and on and on because the, um, the flesh has a strange resiliency. It revives. It comes back demanding more than it did before. It comes back with self-pity stronger. It comes back blaming God. You know, this doesn't feel like love. You deceived me, Lord. Do you ever hear those words? But it's the path of the cross. It was for Jesus, the captain of our salvation, and if he was made perfect through suffering, if he had a better plan, don't you think he would use it? But it's the same for each one of us. The path of suffering. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. His ways are not our ways. His ways are higher. His ways are better. And his ways are perfect. Turn to um, Mark 8. And Jesus went out and his disciples into the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And by the way, he asked his disciples, saying unto them, Whom do men say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. Some say Elias, and others one of the prophets. And he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Peter answereth and said unto him, Thou art the Christ. And he said, Well, now I'm going to make you the first pope of the Catholic Church. (laughs) He didn't say that. 
And he charged them that they should tell no man of him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise up again. And he spake that saying openly and Peter took him and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter saying, Get thee behind me, Satan. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. And when he had called the people with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life, and that life there is, is suki, which I think is usually soul, shall whosoever will save, whoever, whosoever will deliver or protect his life, shall destroy it fully. But whosoever shall lose his life, destroy his life fully. For my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation. Now what would make us be ashamed of him. Pride, right? Of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Um, Mark 10, verse 17. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? You know, the flesh always wants to find something to do. The spirit man knows that he can't do anything. Spirit man knows that he cannot earn his salvation. But the flesh is always wanting to find some religious works to do so he will feel saved. And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor thy father and thy mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, You know, love will always tell the truth. Even though it's a hard truth, love will tell the truth. They have a saying around here, if you don't want to know, don't ask Joyce. <laughs> One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor. You know what he's saying? Give up your idolatry. Give up what you depend upon. Give up your identity. Your persona is that rich man, the mover and shaker. Give up your idolatry, and, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and take up the cross and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and he went away grieved, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked round about and saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answereth again and said unto them, Children, how hard it is for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? And Jesus, looking upon them, saith, With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we've left all and have followed thee. And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you that there is no man that has left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels, but he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and land with 
persecution and in the world to come, eternal life. And they were in the way going up to Jerusalem and Jesus went before them and they were amazed and as they followed they were afraid. And he began again to tell the twelve and he, he took again the twelve and began to tell them what things should happen unto him saying, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priests, to the scribes, they shall condemn him to death, they shall deliver him to the Gentiles, and they shall mock him, and shall scourge him, and shall spit upon him, and shall kill him, and the third day he shall rise. It's funny to me, every time he says that, they miss, and the third day he shall rise. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came unto him, saying, Master, now can you imagine this conversation? Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we shall desire. And he said unto them, What would ye that I should do for you? They said to him, Grant unto us that we may sit, one on the right hand and the other on the left hand, in thy glory. But Jesus said unto them, You know not what you ask. Can you drink of the cup that I drink of and be baptized with the baptism? that I'm baptized with. And they said, we can. And what did they all do? They ran away. <laughs> Verse 43, well, starting but 42, but Jesus called them to him and saith unto them, you know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. And their great ones exercise authority over them, but so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be the slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. You know, he, he doesn't um, give us a, he doesn't deceive us about the gospel. You know, from, from start to finish, it's always the same. Count the cost, and the cost is it's going to cost you everything. Um, that's why he said in one place, strive to enter in the narrow gate. And that strive means agonize because we've continually got to be dealing with other things in our life, things we've got to, to um, give up. Verse, uh, Matthew 15, verse 29, And they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads, and saying, Ah, thou that destroys the temple and builds it in three days, save thyself and come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests, mocking, said among themselves with the scribes, He saved others, himself he cannot save. Let Christ the King of Israel descend now from the cross, that we may see and believe. And they that were crucified with him reviled him. Um, do you know that as you are called by God to endure crosses in your life, and I'm not talking about I'm not talking about a lot of things, but you know the crosses that God has called you to bear. The, the demons in people are always telling you, save yourself. Save yourself. You don't need to go through that. Save yourself. But if we save ourselves, he can't save us because he saves the hopeless and the helpless. Um, Luke 14. Starting in verse 7. And he put forth a parable to those that were bidden when he marked how they chose out the chief rooms, saying unto them, When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. And he that invited you come and say to you, Give this man place. And you begin with shame to take the lowest room. But when you're invited, go and sit down in the lowest place that when he that invited you comes, he may say unto thee, Friend, go up higher. Then shall thou have 
glory or worship in the presence of him that sits at meat with thee. For whosoever exalts himself shall be abased, and he that humbles himself shall be exalted. Then said he also to him that invited him, When you make a dinner or a supper, don't call your friends, nor your brethren, nor your kinsmen, nor your rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and a recompense be made thee. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind, and thou shalt be blessed. For they cannot recompense you, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then he said unto them, A certain man made a great supper and invited many, and he sent his servants at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Who are his servants at supper time going out to invite um, the lame and the halt? Who are his servants? Who can say, It's supper time, come and eat. Um, for all things are now ready. All things got ready at Calvary, didn't they? And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said, I bought a piece of ground and I must go see it. I pray, have me excused. Another said, I bought five yoke of oxen and I've got to go try them out. Pray they have me excused. Another said, I've married a wife and I just can't come. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. And there went great multitudes with him. And he turned and said unto them, If any come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower sits not down first and counts the cost, whether you have enough to finish it, lest after he's laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it began to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to make war against another king, setteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that comes against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends an ambassador and desires conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsakes not all that he has, he cannot be my disciple. How Jesus would ask you, what have you not forsaken? Whatever is tormenting you is what you haven't forsaken. Your idols blind you and torment you. So what have you not forsaken? This word is a sword, it's a hammer, and he's, Jesus is always going right for the spiritual juggler. Where are your idols? Is it family, graven image, happily ever after? Is it um, work? Is it hobbies? Is it, what is it? Whatever it is, is keeping you from being a disciple. And you don't want to be this next. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It's neither fit for the land nor for the dunghill, but it's cast out. That's what the enemy would like for every one of us to be, is salt that's not salty. Salt that does not act as a preservative and salt that does not give a special flavoring to our world around us. Our lives should give 
the world around us a, a flavoring of holiness. And holiness is certainly not the way we dress, although it will influence it. It's uh, holiness is just looking like Jesus. There are times, I'm sure, when Jesus definitely did not look holy to the Pharisees around him because he was right in the middle of whatever was going on. But life was flowing out of him. Life was flowing into him from the Father and flowing out of him to others. But God says, what are your idols? What are you fearful about? Because behind that fear is a great big fat idol. Fat, uh, depending upon how much you fed it with your fears. The only acceptable fear is fear of God. And if we fear him, then we don't fear anything else. What can man do to you? God is the one that we need to fear. Uh, all right, turn to 1 Corinthians 17. I mean 1 Corinthians 1, 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with the wisdom of words or that of wisdom of revelation. Can I just tell you that that is a way that is a way that a lot of people just try to they just try so hard to get revelation to just make people go wow you are so wise but the gospel is not preached with the wisdom of revelation lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect 1 Corinthians 1:17 For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish that have chosen death foolishness but unto us which are saved, which are being saved, which are being delivered and protected, healed, preserved, it is the dunamis, the dynamite of God. So the reason we don't hear much preaching about the cross, it is foolishness. I'm not going to turn there, but in Galatians 6, Paul talks about glorying in the cross by whom the world is crucified to me and I unto the world. Turn to Ephesians 2. We're just going to a couple more places and talking about the cross, the power of the cross. If you're listening to any uh, minister, television or whatever, and if the cross is not central to what he's preaching, and I'm not talking about a pretty little symbol, I read something by Charles Spurgeon a few weeks ago about how absolutely, I don't even remember the word he used, but that the cross, as ugly as it was, should have become something to adorn bodies. The cross was ugly. Everything about the cross was ugly. The stench of the cross, the, the the things that stink most, the burning feathers and burning wool and burning flesh out under that hot desert sun, the stench of death. That's what the cross was all about. It's not an ornament of decoration. And I know that some of you are saying, ouch, or I don't receive that. Well, you don't have to receive it. Ask him. Ask him. All right. Um, Ephesians 2, starting in verse 12. That at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were sometimes far off, are made near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who has made both one, hath broken down the middle wall of partition, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, the law of commandments in ordinances, for to make in himself of two 
one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body to the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit into the Father. Let's stop just for a minute before I read on about our being no longer strangers and foreigners. How can he bring peace through the cross? Because it's at the cross that we are able to have to be for our sins to be washed away and for our conscience, the guilt of our sin to be cleansed through the blood of the cross. The only way we can have peace is when we can know that every rotten, sinful, despicable thing that we've ever done, Jesus took it on the cross. He became sin. He who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And so the only way we can have peace is to know I am forgiven and I can forgive myself. That was not me who did all those things. That was the old man who was crucified with Christ over 2,000 years ago. And that old man is dead and I am one new person in Christ because of the cross. So that's how we can have peace through the cross by which the world is crucified to me. I am now, therefore, you're no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. I want us to look um, at Colossians 2. Yeah, this is just one of my favorite scriptures to, um, that just puts the lie to the fact, puts the lie to the thought that we can get our tickets punched and live like we want to and go to heaven. That we can have heaven in live sinfully here, choose to live sinfully here. Uh, Colossians 2 verse um, hmm, 21. All of it's good, but I won't read all of it. Um, and you that were enemies, you you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight if you continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. What is the hope of the gospel? that we'll be just like Jesus. That God wanted many children just like Jesus and that we are being daily conformed into the image. I'm sorry, I said Colossians 2 and I meant to say 1. Now you want to go back, you want me to read all of it again? Okay, now that you're with me, Colossians 1. You all need to keep up. <laughs> And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight, if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Um, Philippians 2, turn back one book. Um, 5, let this mind be in you, which, chapter 2, verse 5, let this mind be in you, 
which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, now as not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. There's a scripture that I don't know where it is right now um, that says it will perform its work in you when you believe it. So what working out your own salvation with fear and trembling is not is being tormented by demons with doubt and unbelief. That is not it. And I see so many people. I see people who, you know, when affliction comes into these bodies, we do need to say, Lord, your ser- speak, your servant's listening. If you want to teach me something through this or if you have instruction for me, I want to hear it. But he does not want his little children tormenting themselves with, oh, I must have done something. What did I do? He's a good father. And as a good father, he will tell his children what we need to know. So working out our own salvation with fear and trembling It's just letting, going to this word. And then when we see things in the word, not saying, I don't want that. I don't like that part. But just saying, Lord, that's not true in my life now. But I want it to be. Lord, I can see that I don't love like I'm supposed to love. Will you cause me to love? Let me see if I can find a place. I'm not sure I can but I'll try. Um, Okay, Psalm 143. Hold your place where you are and go to Psalm 143. Verse 7. Well, verse 5. Well, verse 4. Let's go back to 1. Hear my prayer, O Lord, give ear to my supplications. In thy faithfulness answer me, and in thy righteousness. And enter not into judgment with thy servant. For in thy sight shall no man living be justified. We are only justified by the blood of the Lamb. For the enemy has persecuted my soul. He has smitten my life down to the ground. He has made me to dwell in darkness as those that have been long dead. Therefore is my spirit overwhelmed within me. My heart within me is desolate. How many times have you felt like that? I remember the days of old. I meditate on all thy works. I muse on the works of thy hands. I stretch forth my hands unto thee. My soul thirsts after thee as a thirsty land. Hear me speedily, O Lord. My spirit's failing. Hide not thy face from me, lest I be like unto them that go down into the pit. And then the cry caused me to hear thy loving kindness in the morning. Because you know why? There are a thousand voices telling you God is not good. There are a thousand voices telling you that he's not for you, that he'll do it for others, but not for you, that he's tired of you. He's tired of your whining. He's tired of your complaining. He he probably is. But, (laughs) But the psalmist said, cause me to hear thy loving kindness in the morning. Because you know what, when we wake, most of us wake up in the morning, there are a couple of different voices, at least a couple talking to us. One is saying, telling you all the reasons why you don't want to get up, right? And the other one is trying to speak to you of the fresh loving kindness of the Lord right then. Cause me to hear thy loving kindness in the morning, for in thee do I trust. Cause me to know the way wherein I should walk. There are many paths. For I lift up my soul to you. Deliver me, O Lord, from my enemies. I flee unto you to hide me. Teach me to do thy will. 
we've heard, cause me, deliver me, teach me to do thy will. For thou art my God. You know, we have to learn to do his will. How does a child learn to walk? By walking. But he falls, right? Teach me to do thy will, for thou art my God. Thy spirit is good. Lead me in the land of uprightness. Quicken or revive me, O Lord, for thy name's sake. For thy righteous sake, bring my soul out of trouble. And of thy mercy, cut off my enemies and destroy all them that afflict my soul, for I am thy servant. Isn't that a good chapter? Hear me, deliver me. I'm thinking about you. I'm thinking about what a mess my life is. But I'm thinking about you. So if anything's ever going to change in my life, Lord, you've got to do it. He's author and he's finisher and he longs to change it. Go back to uh, Philippians 2. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed. See, that's what that psalmist was doing, was working out his own salvation with fear and trembling. I see where I'm weak, Lord. I see part of it. I don't see everything, but you do it, Lord. You be faithful when I'm faithless. Wherefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which works in you, both to will and to do, to energize his good pleasure. Isn't it interesting where he puts this next verse. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, <laughs> that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. All right, let's look at a little more of that in First Peter 2. First Peter 2, verse 18. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the warped and perverse. That's what that forward means. First Peter 2, verse 18. Okay, we'll start again. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the warped and perverse. Now, you don't do their warped and perverse things. The marriage bed does not sanctify everything. Okay? If it can't make a baby, it's probably warped and perverse. Understand? It's awfully quiet. <laughs> if you can't conceive a child there, it's probably not God's design to place. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, you take it patiently or with endurance. But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but commits him, committed himself to him that judges righteously, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree or to the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. So there are situations where we're going to have to commit ourselves unto the one who judges righteously because we're being... Um, mistreated but even and God has to show us individually how to walk through that stuff because I'm convinced there's a place where God does not I know God does not want women and children to be physically abused period 
Now, how that is walked out, I don't really know, but I just know that we're to protect the widows and orphans. And, um, uh, but I also know that demons and women are capable of provoking a man to abuse. You know, I, I, I've seen it in myself at times in my early marriage until um, Milt Green convinced me that was not a good thing to do. Turn to Colossians 2. I think we were there before, but it's a different part. And we're going to stop this session at that point. No, I was in one calling it two. Now I'm in two calling it two. Uh, verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. That vain deceit means empty delusions. After the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation or energy of God, who has raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, has he quickened or made alive together with him, having get forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances which was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in that. And what that says to us literally in that day when Jesus Christ was crucified, if you owed me a debt and there was a bill that you had to pay, you would pay the bill and you would pay the bill until one day it was totally paid. And then I would come to your door with that bill. I would nail it on your door and mark paid in full. That's the word that was used, that Jesus used, translated, it is finished. And every sin that you and I have ever committed, Satan thought he was getting the upper hand when he killed Jesus on the cross. But at the cross was where God blotted out every transgression, every sin, Every time you ever broke the covenant, every time you ever sinned against God, every time you ever sinned against man, it was written and nailed to that cross. And God the Father wrote across Jesus, that battered body, Joyce Green's sins are finished, paid in full. And yours. Now whether every person in the world's sins were forgiven at Calvary. Not all will come by faith. Every man is locked up in a prison house before Calvary. And even though at Calvary Jesus Christ took the sin of the whole world. Not very many come out of the prison house and humble themselves and come the narrow way to Jesus to receive forgiveness, the forgiveness of our sins. But they have been blotted up. Let me read it again. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, has he made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them. 
Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect to a holy day of the new moon or of the Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Let no one cheat you of your reward in voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands, having nourished, ministered, and knit together, increases with the increase of God. Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why are you living? Why, as though living in the world, are you subject to them? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men, which indeed have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, but not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. He's saying you can buffet your body so that you don't eat pork and you don't do, and I don't eat much pork. It's not a religious thing. I just know pigs don't have much of a digestive system. Um, but, you know, I can go through my life not eating pork, not eating white flour, not eating sugar, but I'd have to not come to any of our retreats. <laughs> and I can do all of those things, but none of it saves me. None of it makes me humble. It gives me pride about how much will I have. But the opposite of that is, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection or your mind on things above, not on things on the earth, for you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear in us, then shall you also appear with him in glory, in his nature and character. Mortify or put to death then the members which are upon the earth in your body, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God comes on the children of disobedience, in the which you also walked at one time when you lived in them. But now you also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, Filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Verse 12, put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved. This looks so much like the list in um, Exodus um, 31 where God says, Moses said, show me your glory. And God said, I'll show you my goodness. This parallels that list that God gave Moses of what his goodness is. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity. And charity is a, is a good way to say God's kind of love because if you give to charity, you don't expect anything in return. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness or the perfect bond of unity. And let the peace of God rule in your heart. How do you let the peace of God rule in your heart? Well, you let the cross do its work and bring peace. And then you let peace be your borders. You let it be your boss. And any time you're walking and God removes his peace, you just back up and say, Lord, are you speaking? And he'll tell you. He'll tell you where, when, when you, the borders of peace uh, were, when you left the borders of peace. And usually it's to do your own thing. Uh, Let the peace of God rule in your heart to the which you are also called in one body and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord and whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands 
as it is fit in the Lord. That's just a natural thing that will follow the crucified life. And then notice what it says about husbands. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Why did he say it like that? Because that's exactly where the enemy works in most husbands. The enemy tells your husband, she can't ever be satisfied. She always comes against me. Every time I say something, she always comes against me. You know, when I say I'd like to buy a new speedboat or a fishing boat, she always says we can't afford it. The enemy is always speaking to husbands to make them bitter against wives. And a bitter husband is not able to nurture and cherish his wife. So I used to look at that and I think, well, why did God say that there? He's not. Because that's the way the enemy always works. He always tries to work in the wives to cause them not to submit. Well, I'll submit to him when he's godly. I'll submit to him when he's nurturing and cherishing me. No, if you won't submit to him, before, you won't submit to him after. Submission is a heart attitude. And the word submit means arranged in an orderly fashion under. And the opposite of being arranged in an orderly fashion under is chaos. So you'll have to ask the Lord to teach you about it. But um, he said it. And he said it and he said it. And he said, husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. And he said, children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord, because he knew children would have a hard time obeying. And he said, fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged, because he knew that the hardness in men, not balanced with the wife's uh, emotional input, insight into children, that the husband without that will be harsh with the children and will discourage them. And the enemy wants the wife then to run in right in the middle of it and try to referee, which is not God's position for her at all. She's just in danger of getting knocked over at that point. But you know, everything in this word, he said it just the way it is. And it's in perfect order. And... If we will let him, if we'll cry out to him until he puts our life in perfect order according to his word, then we can, that peace, uh, one, of, one version says, let peace rule as an umpire in your heart. And we're not going to walk in peace unless we're walking in obedience to his word, letting his word and his spirit work out his salvation in us with fear and trembling. Because, you know, I mean, it doesn't matter what anybody is doing to you. You are not ever going to have to answer for what they do to you. But you will have to answer for your response. And any response except love. And, you know, love manifests itself in many ways. Sometimes love does not look like love. Did you know that? That's why you've got to hear it from God. And then no matter what people say, well, that doesn't look like God. You can with confidence say, or you don't have, even have to defend yourself, but you can just know what you know what you know. I heard God, and I'm not moving. No flesh is going to move me, and no devil's going to move me. Amen? Amazing love, how can it be that you my king would die for me amazing love I know it's true it's my joy to honor